Dear audience, on behalf of Arts Equal and the University of the Arts, it is my great honor to introduce the speaker of this Studia Generalia lecture, the prestigious Michael Apple, who is John Passman Professor of Curriculum and Instruction and Educational Policy Studies at the University of Wisconsin Madison in the USA. Professor Apple is an educational theorist who can be characterized as an activist for the democratization of the school system. During his long and extensive career, he has brought forward power issues related to education, school, and curriculum. Professor Apple has worked widely and internationally with other educators, teacher unions, and politicians to promote democratizing practices and policies. Apple's most famous book titles include Ideology and Curriculum, Educating the Right Way, and Can Education Change Society? In his most recent book, The Struggle for Democracy in Education, Michael Apple critically reviews cross-disciplinary models of democratic schooling through international case studies, challenging readers to consider some of the essential and necessary struggles in striving for critical education. In today's lecture, titled The Challenge of Critical Education, Professor Apple will discuss challenges and possibilities related to critical educational research and policy in time of conservatism on a both a personal and academic level, urging us to continue our important work in connecting the arts with movements towards social justice. Please join me in welcoming Professor Michael Apple. It's a pleasure to be here uh, in a very personal way. Donald Trump is not here. <laughs> and uh, I was looking forward to a possibility of spending three or four days without hearing his damn name, seeing his face. Yet when I arrived on Saturday evening at around midnight and turned on the news, there was Mr. Trump's face staring at me. So I wish to dedicate this lecture to Donald Trump and vomit right now. I mean that seriously, by the way. I'm going to do something I almost never do, uh, given a number of lectures here, not in this auditorium, but I almost never read. But this is a section of uh, my newest book, one that I'm working on now, the sequel to Can Education Change Society and the Struggle for Democracy in Education? And it's I'm too damn close to it. I don't feel comfortable being as extemporaneous about it. So I apologize for that. For those of you who know me, I'm a former union mobilizer, and I tend to be a little more emotional when I speak. So I'm going to stick to a text. Uh, that will guarantee that I don't waver, but I do apologize, it's not something I usually do. So I'm going to talk both personally and politically as well as educationally. And just as importantly, um, I want to, to use this as a response. I've argued here and elsewhere that there is no safe spot, no neutral position that one can take. So I'm arguing against some of what we have heard today. I think that there is no pristine position that is value free and the search for it is itself ideological. Non-action, inaction is an action. The spaces that are available are either filled by critical cultural workers, critical teachers, critical artists in multiple places, or they are filled by other people. And throughout the world, they are filled by people uh, who do not care about hearing anything except about audits. Now, it is a, what I want to call an epistemological war on human understanding and an attempt to reduce our understandings in powerful ways to make us have suffered from historical amnesia. So I'm going to be talking about that as as much as I can, but it means that I'm not just speaking about the arts, 
And I'm not just speaking to people who have been convinced that cultural politics are crucial. I want to speak to a broader audience that includes people here, but also people who have not had the privilege of being here. And that would include many of my colleagues and friends who call themselves the left. I am profoundly of the left myself with no apologies, but there are parts of it that make me deeply worried, deeply worried about its rhetorical artifice, its assumption that only issues of the economy count. I think that is a mistake. It's quite masculinist and it's utterly racist. And I refuse to perform whiteness in public. And as the father of an African-American child myself, I take this not simply as an issue that is academic, it's about my family. Okay? Okay, you've, done, you've heard the argument now. Goodbye. <laughs> um, all right. So let me go into this talk. Uh, I'm brilliant as a reader, if I can remember the vocabulary. Um, you'll forgive the humor. Those of you who know me know that my last name is Apple. And I spent the first three years of my life uh, as a teacher as a primary and secondary school teacher in public schools in the slums of New Jersey where I grew up and I'm from a very poor family. Um, and if you, I would call up every morning, I was what is called a substitute or supply teacher under contract. So I would walk, I'd call up at 6.15 every morning and the school board would tell me what school to go to. And if you walk into a classroom every day and have to introduce yourself as, hi kids, my name is Mr. Apple. It would take them four days to get off the damn light fixtures. Um, and uh, you develop a pedagogic style that occasionally is cute and funny. So laugh occasionally, otherwise I will keep trying. And I assure you, that is not what you want in this lecture. All right? Let me begin. In my talk here today, I want to reflect on a number of the changes in education and the larger society and in the power relations that underlie cultural institutions like schools and the media that are having profound effects. In the process, I also want to think about the current and future status of critical educational commitments and research in a time of steeply rising inequalities in a considerable number of nations. At times, I shall also be somewhat personal. My reflections are based on more detailed analyses in a number of my recent books, including Can Education Change Society, The Struggle for Democracy in Education, and this piece, which is part of the forthcoming 40th anniversary edition of Ideology and Curriculum. Thus, my points can be followed up there. If you want to feel old, realize that 40 years ago I wrote a book that's still in publication. That's distressing. I saw a picture of myself from that time. I will never look at that picture again. Um, you can understand why as I stroke my beard. I don't plan to focus too much on Finland, and this is not out of ignorance, but out of respect. Since each time I am here, I become more ignorant. It is clear that Finland is one damn complicated place. <laughs> and although some of what I say can be applied to Finnish context, the plural is absolutely central here. Much of what I shall talk about has its roots, in my in-depth experiences in other nations, such as the belly of the beast, the United States, England, Turkey, Brazil, Argentina, Chile, China, Korea, and elsewhere. Before I became a university professor, I was an elementary and secondary school teacher and president of the teachers' union. Thus, part of my commitment has always been to work at the intersections of theory, policy, and practice and to expand the sphere of critical educational efforts at each of these levels. I mention this because in my work with schools, teachers, researchers, social movements, prisoners, dissident groups, and community activists, I've been deeply impressed with the courage of committed educators, artists, community activists, and students in these schools, these homes, these jails, these communities. And such courage is even more important today. As many of you may already know, I have grounded my work in the belief that it is absolutely crucial to understand the social realities in which we work. And what is happening today makes these analyses even more significant. Although it is not the only force that is present, in all too many nations, neoliberalism and its attendant policy initiatives 
by changing our common sense about education. Such things as changing our very definitions of democracy, so democracy is simply purchasing its choice on a market. The impulsive audit cultures of performance pay, of never-ending competition, of privatization, of attacks on teachers and teachers' unions, on women's bodies, on the bodies of people of color and migrants, a climate of white supremacy and anti-immigrant mobilizations, a culturally restorative project to reinstall what is assumed to be high-status knowledge in schools, a reduction of what is seen as crucial knowledge to only that which serves the economic interests of dominant groups and races, the massive defunding of the arts is part again of an epistemological war, and similar reforms are increasingly transforming what counts as a good school, a good teacher, a good curriculum, a good parent, a good student, a good community, a good jail, legitimate culture, important evidence. Education has once again become a site of crucial struggles over authority and identity, indeed over both the very meaning of being educated and who should control it. Now all of these reforms have particular histories, and all of them are driven not only by technical considerations, because there are no such things as merely technical considerations, but also profoundly by cultural, political, and economic projects and by specific and often unquestioned ideological visions of what schools should do and whom they should serve. And like most of us in this audience, I believe we have an ethical obligation to challenge these positions. And if you don't believe that, you shouldn't call yourself an educator or an artist. Those of you who are familiar with my work may know that I ask quite simple questions quite in U.S. language. It's not like British English. It means very, not a diminutive. As I learned with a debate with Basil Bernstein once, where he sent me a paper and I sent a missile back saying, Dear Basil, this is quite interesting. And he sent me back an intercontinental ballistic missile, accusing me of being despicable and a child. I may be despicable, but I'm not. You can change your mind later on. <laughs> so, let's rather than simply asking whether students have mastered a particular subject matter and have done well on our all too common tests, we should ask a different set of questions. Whose knowledge is this? How did it become official? What is the relationship between this knowledge and how it is organized and taught? And who has cultural, social, and economic capital in the society? Who benefits from these definitions of legitimate knowledge and who does not? What are the overt and hidden effects of educational reforms on real people and real communities? What can we do as critical educators, cultural activists, and others to change the existing educational and social inequalities and to create curricula and teaching that are more socially just? And fundamental to both asking and answering these are the complex and at times contradictory relationships among legitimate and at times sacred culture and popular and at times profane culture. And in fact, as you know from feminist standpoint theory and by feminists and anti-racist philosophies, it is a conceptual requirement for us to have the opposite in order to make sense of what we call legitimate. There can be no official culture unless we define something as illegitimate. For STEM to be fine, no. we need something that is the opposite, the arts, the popular. And in fact, at my own university, we have, we have closed the art education program. And the only way we smuggle in the arts is to redefine STEM as STEAM. So the arts are only to be valued if we have creative scientists and engineers, and yes, we can measure that. I'm sorry, my heart just pounded. I'm having a heart attack here. <laughs> you may wish for a more powerful one in a few minutes. But for me, one other question has been central. Indeed, it is the basic issue that should guide any critical cultural work and any critical education. Can our work change society? This is the fundamental question that's guided all of my work 
and the work of many people in the arts and culture program. A little educational history of the United States may be helpful here, since I am part, as you are, a very long tradition both inside and outside of education. In the 1930s, George Counts, one of the most famous radical educators in the United States, electrified an audience of progressive, progressive educators, authors, filmmakers, and said the following. He raised the question about a dominant class that he thought had gained control of schooling and the economy, and this must be fought so that schools could lead the way along with progressive work in the arts toward a more democratic society. And the title of his lecture and the published book that came out of it was a simple question. Dare cultural workers create a new social order? This was at one and the same time a call to action and let's be honest, a quite naive claim. Could schools and the arts or other forms of cultural politics actually alter a social order? Did they have any independent power? What was later called by Althusser in critical social theory, the problem of relative autonomy. If so, what constituted such power? If not, what relations did schools and cultural work participate that made such independent political action impossible or at least unlikely. Let's also be honest, of course, these kinds of issues were consistently raised by organic intellectuals in oppressed communities and in communities of color and women's groups in your society and mine for a very long damn time. And to think this is a new question is to perform masculinity and to perform whiteness again. You cannot understand Sami unless you understand these questions. You cannot understand women's demand to have access to universities unless you understand these questions. And you can't understand the family history of the person called Apple unless you understand that growing up poor, I could not afford to go to a university. I had to work and pay and only go to night school at the least attractive place called Patterson State Teachers Institute and had to prove myself later on in order to be standing here today. So that is class and race and gender and many of us are still sacrificing to be at these institutions as well. And while I've tried to answer these questions myself in Can Education Change Society, which is on sale for twice the price for that side. No, that is a joke. By the way, in case you're wondering if I do refer to my own work, my wife, Professor Rima Apple, and I get no money from our books, all the royalties, and all the money I make from lectures or community work or working in prisons and get a fee for it, goes back to social mobilizations and movements. So it's not that I, I want you to read it, but I'm not going to buy a Mercedes. Actually, I do want to buy a Mercedes. <laughs> As a working class kid from Patterson, New Jersey, it's very important for reasons that Donald Trump would understand to have something big. <laughs> Think about it. <laughs> I can get a little dirty too, I'm sorry. Okay. You can't be from New Jersey or the United States unless you make one dirty joke. If I make two, I don't know. Never mind. <laughs> I'm proving that I can't stick to a text. Okay. So I've tried to answer this question. In the process of struggling with these issues, one thing has become very clear to me. It's a truly difficult question, both to ask and to answer. Yet although important questions such as can schools and cultural work create a new social order, and what is their role in social change, is actually premature. Before we can answer these questions, we need to more fully understand the ways in which they and the curricular, pedagogic, and evaluative principles that involve our own work that go on within them are determined. Thus speaking metaphorically prior to asking about education and cultural works inside to outside relationship, we need to ask about the outside to inside connections. And we cannot be reductive either in our questions or our answers. The word reductive crucial here. The political as well as academic implications of this are significant, since it asks us to be very easy, very cautious of easy 
and overly rhetorical answers. Anyone who knows me and knows almost all of us in this room also knows that we are definitely not asking for inaction, for quiescence, or just accepting the world as it is, far be it. But we do insist that we be mindful of complexity and contradiction of hidden relations and effects. And often minoritized people in women's movements have again asked these questions and demanded that we answer them for a very, very long time. And this is crucial if we are collectively and individually to successfully challenge not just the neoliberal dominant forms of hegemonic relations, but also neoconservative forms, authoritarian populist religious forms, and managerial new middle class relations that are making it so very hard to build and defend an education and cultural work worthy of their names. But behind this is a claim. If you think it's only neoliberalism all the time, you haven't been paying attention. The fastest growing mobilizations throughout the world are religious, the Hindu movement in India, demanding that any Muslim representations and art forms be taken down and destroyed, the destruction of Palestine and Israel and Palestine, the U.S. government's and Betsy DeVos, our Secretary of War on Education, who is an evangelical Christian, demanding this, uh, that teachers be armed now because the Muslim infidels are about to invade our nation. Let me repeat that. That government money go to train all teachers how to arm themselves and money to spend to arm teachers. And there is legislation in the legislature of my own state the socialist state of the United States of Wisconsin that would allow teachers and excuse me, students at universities to bring guns into classrooms because God wishes us to protect our religious freedom. I've already told my university that I and my students will refuse to enter the buildings. So these things are going on right now. It is unfortunate, but true. Okay. So it's become something of a truism in the literature and analytic philosophy that language does and can do many things, all of them valuable. It can be used to describe, explain, control, critique, legitimate, affiliate, and mobilize. And rhetorical language is associated with legitimation, affiliation, and mobilization, but it is quite often a poor tool for the other tasks that language must perform. This is an important point that bears on the arguments I've made over the years. And it's related to my own studies and my master's degrees in analytic and continental philosophy. And it's also related to the critical cultural and political theorists such as Antonio Gramsci, Raymond Williams, and Stuart Hall, who have had such a strong influence on me and so many people in cultural studies. And all too many parts of the critical education and cultural traditions seem to be content with rhetorical slogans rather than examining the complicated multiple structures and power relations that exist in the real world and the full range of possible tactics that might be employed to change them. As an example, what does social justice actually mean? This is not an easy question. It is contextual and it requires serious study of who has power and what the interrupted strategies are. Otherwise, it is simply rhetorical. Now, this is a pity since this lack has a number of negative effects. It weakens the explanatory potential of critical analyses in the arts and in so much else. It paradoxically helps those who wish to marginalize critical analyses at exactly the same time as they are even more important. And finally, such rhetorical positions lack the strategic sensibility that is so critical to what Antonio Gramsci called a war position, a nuanced understanding of the actual possibilities of doing critical work in multiple sites. I'll give one example. It is perfectly possible, for instance, for us to say we want to defend teachers' rights to do powerful cultural work in schools in the arts. And at the same time, when migrant groups say, I don't see myself in this text, and claim that the teacher is being racist, 
in her absent present curriculum, in what is missing, and the teacher saying, but I have professional responsibility to choose the curriculum for you. Is that socially just? So indigenous people in Taiwan, as an example, who claim that the national curriculum has no place for the indigenous people of Taiwan, are claiming that it is not socially just, even though it supposedly has been done under a new or slightly more democratic administration. Am I clear? Okay. So this cannot be treated rhetorically. Now, this is not true of all of the critical tr traditions, of course. Some of the most interesting work in critical education and the arts is much less rhetorical and is grounded in the concrete understanding of an action in and with communities, cultural activists, practicing educators at all levels, and social movements. In fact, some of the best work in the world is done in this program on that. And there are people in the audience, many of you who have been my teachers, of how this can go on. And much of the more robust and nuanced theoretical and political analyses have emerged, that have emerged on the state, on the complex relationships among culture, politics, and the economy, on the absolutely essential importance of the arts and popular cultural forms and social transformation, on the ways in which elderly sites, educational sites and institutions, on prisons and detention centers, on immigrant community groups, on how they can be worked on and, and, and with that have developed over the past decade of intense, intense conceptual political progress have been produced by this project. Once again, so many of them and you exemplify the role of what I have called in Can Education Can Change Society, the role of the critical scholar activist, not simply the public intellectual, the activist side of that. And this is one of the reasons that the Arts Equal Project that has its roots here is so important, not only, only for Finland, but for the world. I'm being more generous than I usually am, but it's actually important that you realize that the work you're doing is significant for me as well. However, now comes the book. B-U-T-T -T is not what I'm saying. That was a joke. Some of you understand what I just said, others of you have no clue. Um, there will be a thesaurus handed out later on. Thus, there have been real successes that give me reasons for optimism. But to be honest, I worry seriously about some of what counts as success in critical work. So let me tell a story here. During a series of lectures and some work with critical educators and authors and artists in a country in Asia, I spent a good deal of time with postgraduate students. Many of them had been or still were teachers in the public schools of that country or community literacy workers. We talked about many things and I was deeply impressed with their knowledge of a large array of work in critical educational and cultural theory and research. And during our conversations, they told me that one of the major reasons they were more than a little familiar with some of the core work in critical pedagogy and critical cultural work, including much of my own work, was because it was simply included on the standardized test that teachers and graduate students in art schools had to take as an official part of their program. Well, this is a paradoxical situation. On the one hand, it clearly shows that what Isaac Gossman has called the critical turn in education and the arts has been integrated into the formal corpus of official knowledge and education throughout the world. And I'm certain that this was not an easy thing to do, and it constitutes a major victory, since some of the graduate students, in many ways, tried doing that in their classrooms and lost their jobs. On the other hand, as Jeff Whitty has noted, such incorporation may also signify a process of co-optation, of taking insurgent knowledge and turning it into simply one more academic area that needs to be studied for examinations, thus severing its connections to its political roots. This is something I too worry about publicly, since rather than politicizing the academic, 
It academicizes the political. It cuts off the roots of why we are doing this in the first place. Thus, like the rest of the world we live in, critical education and critical cultural work is caught up in contradictory relations of power. But a realization of these contradictions must not cause paralysis and cynicism. It must drive us to constantly remember and reconnect with the critical impulses and commitments that have led to a growth of critical analyses and action in the arts and education in the first place. We must not participate in our own collective amnesia. Now, at the very root of these concerns are two simple principles I've talked about here before. Let me reiterate them briefly. First, we must think relationally. That is, all of our institutions and sets of social relations, even our very identities, need to be seen as intimately connected to the inequalities that structure our societies and to the movements that seek to interrupt such inequalities. As I've mentioned here before, this is the text that I've written for today. When I wrote it, I went into my office in the teacher education building at the University of Wisconsin. I walked up the stairs of the building, I unlocked my door, I turned on the lights, and I turned on the computer, and I began to type. That's not what really happened. Yes, Apple did all those physical mobile movements, but in my city, we burned coal to electricity. And in order for me to give a political and academic lecture, I now have an anonymous social relationship with the miners who dug the coal, 250 of whom must die and be badly injured in the Appalachian region of the United States where the coal is dug. And when they clear cut that coal, it gets dumped into the streams with the mercury and other um, chemicals that go in to make it clean coal into the water table, and the children I care so much about as a teacher drink that and suffer brain injuries because of it. And whether I like it or not, in order for me to do the kind of work I find committed to social justice, I now am connected even in my own best work with the children who are being made ill, with the minors who are losing their lives, and with the families that are destroyed by my need for electricity. Clear? Not nice? That makes it compelling that we think about these kinds of things. So that's the first, relational analysis. Second, in order to understand and act on education and its complicated connections to the larger society, we must engage in a process of what I call repositioning. It will be hard, but we must constantly try to see the world through the eyes of the dispossessed and act against the ideological and institutional processes and forms that reproduce oppressive and deeply disrespectful conditions. And this repositioning concerns both political and cultural practices that embody the principles of critical cultural work. But it also has generated a large body of critical scholarship and theory that has led to a fundamental restructuring of what the roles of research and researcher are, a rearticulation that is part of the work of the people in this room as well when they are doing participatory and critical action research and making public the struggles of people doing serious work with the elderly and elsewhere in the arts. Now this has often led to some truly serious conflicts within the critical traditions. The plural is crucial here as a strength. Yet this too can create real problems. This often has meant that small differences get magnified into chasms so wide as to be unbridgeable. As my grandfather, a former labor activist who never finished primary school, used to take me aside and say, Michael, always remember one thing when you're acting. That the left, when it is forming a fighting squad, always organizes itself in a dance circle. Think about that. That is, we don't need the right to kill us. We're perfectly capable of doing it ourselves. Now, one of my objectives, and I hope one of all of our objectives, has always been to argue against such chasms. 
In this regard, the right has demonstrated something of considerable importance in its formation of a hegemonic bloc that includes neoliberals, neoconservatives, authoritarian populist, populist religious conservatives, and a particular fraction of the professional and managerial middle class that believes one thing. If it moves in classrooms, measure it, and if it hasn't moved yet, measure the damn thing in case it moves tomorrow. And it's often been willing to compromise among its varied tendencies in order to push education and cultural work in particular directions and to use education as part of its larger strategy to radically transform a larger society. And as I say elsewhere, if the right can do this, why can't we? The most dangerous word in English and in Finnish, we. It is not only a term of inclusion, it's a term of exclusion. And unless we problematize that word at the same time as we're thinking about what we mean by social justice, we have failed. I'll try and alienate everyone. If I have them at the end, would you let me know what we're good at? So. But this means that there must be more openness, more willingness to form alliances across our differences than has often been the case. And whether we like it or not, the Arts Equal Project is an attempt to do that. It's not only about the other out there, it's about can we model the cooperative forms that enable the arts to work together in a political and cultural project. And if that we fails, that may be the worst thing that happens with the project. I'm sorry to create tensions. But this creates a dilemma. For me, too much of what counts as the critical traditions in education and cultural work are either overly economistic and formulaic, there's nothing we can do until we change the economy. Excuse me, I think art teachers work in schools. That is the economy, as I remember. The economy is the places where people do unpaid and paid labor. What you're telling me is that I'm an art educator or an artist, I should wait for someone to act. That seems a little odd to me, and it evacuates social responsibility massively. Or, as I noted earlier, simply rhetorical. And I fear that, that too many of these arguments do not have a substantive epistemological, political, theoretical, or just as importantly, the very practical understanding of the foundational material that are supposedly being drawn upon. Critical issues involving cultural struggles and the role of the arts, the state, the need for a much more nuanced understanding of class formation and mobilization, the very real complexity of the economy, the relative autonomy of gender and race, the restructuring of common sense, and the list goes on and on. All of these are treated as epiphenomenal or simply ignored. Sometimes it's as if postmodern and post-structural abstractions have led to amnesia, to forgetting the very real structures that organize this society. Poverty and patriarchal and racist relations ain't discursive. People starve. Bodies wash up on beaches. That's not discursive. We make discourses about it unless we come to grips with the gritty materialities that we face. The fact in the United States that the crayons we give out in art classes have arsenic in them that children nibble on while they are drawing their pictures in the kindergartens of schools and preschool programs in the United States. We need to have critical discourses about it. But in the meantime, the kids are eating arsenic. Is that clear? Okay. Perhaps even more problematic is the loss of memory of the crucial importance of the arts and the school as arenas of and for cultural and social mobilizations. This is deeply disrespectful since it marginalizes a good deal of practical work in schools and communities, in elderly centers, in jails, in community literacy programs, and it substitutes a search for purity for the messy stuff of actually collectively and individually building curricula, literacy practices, 
critically democratic modes of teaching and working with communities on issues of class, gender, race, sexuality, ability, age, and so much more. This is, of course, another reason I have so much respect for many of the people with whom I have worked here in Finland and in the Arts Equal Project, since collectively you have worked on just about every level one can think of, from powerful critical research to issues of policy to the daily struggles to do good things in classrooms and other spaces. And this realization, this memory of working at every level is one of the reasons that when someone asks me what I do, someone asks me this on a plane over actually, I just simply answer I'm a teacher and I happen to be a filmmaker as well. Indeed, if I forget what this means to who I am, I fear I will lose one of the main reasons I'm committed to the multiple projects of critically democratic work. But teaching doesn't only go on in university classrooms, in preschools, and in primary and secondary schools. Pedagogic work is all over these societies, and it goes on in the media as well. Let me give another example of why this is an important realization. Like many of you, I am regularly on radio and television, speaking about issues of educational policy and about cultural politics. Most of the time, I'm on calling programs where a major book, a report, or a controversy in the arts and education has been in the news and has gotten and in the attention of the public. If you will, thinking about what we heard today, it's beginning to warm up. I get a little nervous about that kind of talk. But I'm a polite guy, at least sometimes. And the format of these programs may be familiar to many of you. There's an introduction to the issue, and I'm then asked to speak about it for five or ten minutes, and then the calls start coming in, and come in they do. I'm deeply committed to such programs for a variety of reasons. Um, first, it has a participatory format. If you think about what we heard about the people you listen to, it tends to be very, very formal around the phone interviews. I'm sorry, I want to get my ears dirty. I want to listen to people in their own settings of their own choices. And if I have to buy the coffee, that's fine. So, secondly, these kinds of media serve a pedagogic function, one in which I can reach a much wider audience than a university class, or even the most notable of my books and articles. Third, just as importantly, it creates a situation where I must speak clearly. I must not quote from Gramsci or Foucault or Stuart Hall or myself for that matter. And one other reason is of great importance. Neoliberal and neoconservative voices have been very successful in basically colonizing this space. Millions of people listen to populist rightist commentators or entertainers since there is little news in the myths and distortions that form the majority of what they actually say. The calls are varied, but one thing that is always striking to me in my, in my own nation and elsewhere is the growing level of mistrust of public school teachers, of unions, the curriculum, teacher education programs, artists, authors, these are elites. They are things. Why are we funding these? The language in which all of these things are criticized is often quite emotional, and the amount of vitriol, of anger, is pronounced. And this is often coupled with a reliance on very selectively picked conclusions about research or statements about what we all know, ones that are themselves based on research that is itself either weak or has been discredited where God help us comes from the mouth of Macri in Argentina, or Donald, I won't say his name, I will have a heart attack, the Donald in the United States, or elsewhere. Now these, of course, are not the only callers, nor are they usually the majority. Many people call in who are articulate in their defense of the novel, in their defense of films, in their defense of critical teaching. Others call them because they're genuinely puzzled and are concerned and they don't trust the government and they can be pulled to the right or in more progressive directions. And they're open to hearing alternative explanations about crucial issues 
on matters of compelling audience. Should the kid be reading, Esther has two eyes. These kinds of things, they want some help. Is Picasso really a dirty painter? After all, I didn't see the nude in it walking down the staircase. Why do they want to sanitize it? It's interesting the questions that are raised. I mention all this because the discourses that increasingly circulate through the media and that are now becoming common sense are powerfully influenced by the forces of what I have elsewhere called conservative modernization. As I've documented at greater length in educating the right way, the dominant tendencies in educational reform and in the attacks on the arts in a large number of countries and indeed in the entire public sphere are moving us in directions that have damaging consequences in terms of robust understandings of democracy and the necessity of a fully participatory, critically democratic cultural assemblage as a crucial path to achieving it. This is one of the major reasons that in the list of tasks about the critical scholar activists I discuss in my recent books, Can Education Change Society? and the struggle for democracy in education. I stress the importance of also relearning how to talk in ways that do not mystify, that embody a real commitment to making the case for a more robust, critically democratic education and cultural work clearly and in compelling ways publicly. And let me be honest, we are part of the problem as well as part of the solution. So when I am with people who are writing monuments, and I'm with now black authors who are writing in the vernacular, they are just as conscious about the audiences that are not served as the audiences that are being served right now. And just as feminists have demanded, rightly so, that our common sense is filled with patriarchal language, so too is our common sense about the arts, even by many practicing artists, not understanding the marginalization that something go, that something goes on, or the language that we use in research. Let me give one example from some of the talk that has gone on today by people for whom I have the most respect in the world. The use of the word stakeholder. The history of that word is genocide. It comes from English. The word after indigenous people made the long walks, that is, their land was stolen. After for 117 years in the history of the United States government, when indigenous people were given smallpox infected blankets to keep warm on the long march from the land that was taken to them to the west of the United States many of them dying in the process, the government issued wooden stakes and opened the West for colonization. And you were given the stake to drive into the land as you took the land as your own, put your name on it, and then went to the local registration office for land and said, this is now my land. And the language we use now to signify constitutive forms of democracy. We want stakeholder democracy. Anyone has a voice, which I want to applaud. At the same time, connects us to the loss of memory of whose land it actually was. And as someone who wrote about stakeholder democracy myself, it's a little painful. And if I had a chance to rewrite that, I sure as hell would. Okay? So, so is this enough? This deconstruction of weeds, this attempt to restore collective memory, this trying hard not to be rhetorical, connecting ourselves to lived experience and practice, is it enough? Of course not. Will speaking out and acting back at times be difficult and risky? Definitely. But as I said in the introduction, non-action is an action. But let us be honest. Doing this in an increased numbers of measures is risky. 
In my concluding section, I want to talk a little bit about this, and then I'll be finished. I'll be finished about midnight. Okay? Um, but I've ordered pizza for everyone, <laughs> including gluten-free. But coming from the United States, of course, I'll ask you to pay for it. I don't find that funny either. Okay. Okay. Or I'll drop a bomb on you if you don't. Okay, I'm sorry, there's not enough brown people in the room. We'll save the bombs for the end. You're a bad player. No, never mind. I'll stop. Okay. I'm sorry. I, I get pissed off easily. But as my parents reminded me, my it is always better to be pissed off than pissed on. So um, that was a joke as well. Have I been profane? That was the, sorry, that's the second profane joke. So I must get it close. Finishing. Those of you who heard me before, this is not a surprise. Okay. So, all right. So I need to say a bit more about this. Right now in Turkey, we could not hold this conference. Many artists and art educators, many critical educators are in jail. Many of them have had to flee the nation. Many of my friends are now living in Germany, not because they love Germany, but because they have just been released from jail for 80 days, and then when they walk out of the jail, they are jailed again for 80 days because the law says you can only be jailed for 80 days. And people who were in a seminar with me have now lost their jobs. And the chancellors and deans of schools of education and the arts have all been changed. And Erdogan has put in his allies to take their place. In Brazil, Bolsonaro will be elected. Macri has been elected. Donald Trump is doing what he does. This is a risky time. And my position is do not assume that because Finland has a history of particular kinds of democracy, that when democracy is talked about, it will be talked about in the same way. And as uh, you know, Tuliki reminded me, when I argue that democracy is a sliding signifier, that's not just in the United States or the UK or other nations. It is a sliding signifying signifier here. And the right has understood that in order to make massive changes in curriculum and in the arts, it must catch its language in democracy and change the very meaning of democracy itself. So in all too many nations, democracy is now choice on market. Free choice will guarantee democracy. There is no nation in the world where setting the market loose, where the bourgeois model of free choice has led to the diminution of inequalities. It has led to further inequalities as well. Those with economic capital and cultural and social capital are privileged. That should not surprise us. People knew that before Bourdieu was born. But now we have the academic skills to understand it, which is crucial. And it makes our work academically even more crucial. So this is not enough. And let me say a bit more in conclusion. As many of you know from personal experiences, and as unfortunately I know from my own and many of my friends' struggles, and at times arrests, and I don't romanticize that, that's scary. OK, so I understand this. In many nations throughout the world, there are very real risks in engaging individually and collectively in taking our responsibilities as critical cultural workers and critical educators deeply seriously. And I cannot tell you what risks to take. That is the worst possible way to embody critical pedagogic work. What do I tell someone who's a critical art educator who has elderly parents that she is supporting? And as a single mother or father, the only income coming in is doing X, keeping one's job, that you should risk your job. That is really disgusting. Okay? So do not misinterpret me. I do not want to perform arrogance on this. Right? But there can be little doubt that the right and authoritarian governments, and governments that do not have official policies that seem authoritarian, 
but they will act back against those of us who engage in particular kinds of things. So yes, there will be real risks in doing these things, but if we, as people who think about and write about this, do not take these risks, how can you criticize others for not doing it? Thus, we must continue to act. The right will respond, of course, but the fact that the right will be forced to respond should actually be seen as a positive sign. It means that they realize that our work is important, that our work can lead to increased possibility of making gains, using the arts in powerful ways, restoring the memory of the power of forms of knowing and being that are absolutely crucial to the history and identities of all of us. And they realize that they may have to retreat on these crucial issues. But if we're to continue to successfully challenge the right to education in paid and unpaid workplaces, in the media, in government, in our schools, in, our, in all these centers we have worked with, certain things must, be, must continue to be done now. Raymond Williams reminds us that creating and defending a fully participatory critical democracy in all of our lives requires providing the conditions that make it possible for all people to actually fully participate and not through just phone calls. It is exactly this more full participation and what this actually means in all its contradictions that is one of the main political, ethical, and educational foundations for a truly a politically wise cultural sphere and critical education. In looking around us in all too many nations, it is more than a little visible that these conditions are increasingly difficult to build and sustain. In my own nation, for example, the economic conditions experienced by so many people, the racist rates of incarceration, a truly frightening fact that in my own state one out of every four African-American young men has been or is now in prison. In my own state, the home of the United States, socialism, in my own state. More money is spent on prisons than all of higher education and the arts together. The closing and defunding of absolutely necessary health centers for poor women and women of color the destructions of communities, the loss of safety nets, the attacks on paid and unpaid labor on unions, the defunding of the arts and of education on all levels, the ideological attacks on curriculum and teachers, the massive amounts of money spent on the war machines of so many nations, and the list goes on and on, and all of this is real and truly damaging. It can only be described as a national disgrace. Thus, there's much for us to do in many places where it needs to be done. There's a growing recognition here and elsewhere that truly radical changes in our structures, policies, and common sense are essential, and that we must defend things that we took for granted. Our lives work. The things that, we, that give us our identities are now under threat. There's growing recognition of all of this, and the task seems so big, and this can be disheartening and even paralyzing. But we must start somewhere. I used to work in factories, I no longer work there. I work at universities, in prisons, in the arts, and elsewhere. Is my work unimportant? Is your work unimportant? Until the factories change? I think not. We must start somewhere, and we need to actively resist the all-too-widespread assumption that education and cultural forms are not powerful as transformative agents, that they can only change after society is transformed. The second most dangerous word in our language, society. It's like the word social justice. What does it mean? It is too big. It feels like there's nothing I can do. It's this thing that glows in the dark. Well, society is made up of us and all the places we work, of families, of prisons, of artists, of children, where all of us work. 
educational institutions and cultural work and the people who work in them are key parts of societies. Struggles there are essential parts of what I call a war position. And Chantal Mouffe makes a key point when she states that now we first need to restore democracy, to remember it, to live it, so that we can then radicalize it. And the act of restoring and strengthening thick forms of democracy in the cultural sphere of education, in families, in our daily lives, is where we can start. A project to which so many people here today have already devoted their lives to, in schools, universities, communities, and so much else. Thus, despite what we know about the forces of dominance that we face, and about the tensions and contradictions that are visible all around, we choose to continue the struggle for thick democracy inside and outside of the institutions of education and culture that seem so very important to the projects of social empowerment to us and to so many millions of people in the world. My own position, and that of so many other committed people here, elsewhere, and especially in this room, should perhaps be characterized as optimism with no illusions whatsoever. Thus, we can be and will frequently be disappointed in the results of the hard work of building emancipatory cultural forms and politics in and through education and the arts. But we must actively refuse to be disillusioned. Raymond Williams again provides wise words when he says, we must speak for hope as long as it doesn't mean suppressing the danger. As he goes on to say, it is only in the shared belief and insistence that there are practical alternatives that the balance of forces and chances begins to alter. Once the inevitabilities are challenged, we can begin gathering our resources for what is best seen as a journey of hope. If there are no easy answers, there are still available, discoverable, hard answers. And it is these we can now learn to make and share. And this has been from the beginning the sense and impulse that we participate in, what we should best call the long revolution. And the now my final word. The struggle for, for critical democracy in the arts, in communities, and education is a key part in challenging those inevitabilities. Let's remember that our work is important. Let us continue to act. And nothing will diminish my own commitment to join you in such action. Thank you.
nation uh, uh, between the different uh, Democratic Party or or, or uh, another one. Yeah, the different parties strategy may uh, one of them are uh, some kind of pro-China and <laughs> another is uh, yeah. anti-communist. So it's all my favorite rock band, Pearl Jam, Bruce Springsteen, they're anti-Trump. But, you know, uh, the Taiwan's independent status now is, is better than Obama. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. First, let me pick up on one thing that you said, and that is the concept of contradictions. I am not and never have been a theorist of reproduction. I'm a theorist uh, of contradiction. Things are yes, yes, and no at one and the same time. Um, I like Springsteen, but that's a different issue. Um, first, first of all, um, I am not, I am what is called, uh, well, I am utterly unromantic about the possibilities of the arts, whatever we mean by that word, and I'm not certain anymore what it does mean. Um, as this sort of mobilizing thing, we will go out and change the world. Okay. I have a theory called it's quite Gramscian, who argues that cultural struggles are central to any lasting mobilizations. But I also believe that it is social movements that transform institutions, not individuals. Okay. So the history of even defending the arts in schools, as an example, requires more than art teachers and artists. But I make a distinction between a war of maneuver and a war of position. War of maneuver is World War I. You're there, I'm here, there's trenches. You, um, Haiti yells charge, you charge, I yell charge. Um, my friend, I'm alone here, um, charge. And whoever is left standing wins, frontal assault. As Gramsci reminds us, that is not how modern warfare begins, especially in cultural struggles. A war of position is what the right practices. Everything counts. The arts count. Women's lives count. The media counts. Okay. All of that counts. And what the right does is connect those struggles in multiple spheres together. So I do not think that the arts by themselves are radically transformative by themselves. But cultural form and content and the struggle over that goes on in many sites. And it's absolutely central to this theory of a world position. Okay? And if you disagree with me, I have the means to make sense. I'm the one with the machine gun here. So, anyway. Okay. All right. So. Any other questions or comments right now? of 
the country in his book, Country in the City, is that the countryside must be preserved in some ways, but not in its romantic vision, that it carries the seeds of cooperative forms. Now, there's a long history of that in religious impulses in the United States about Methodism as an example of preserving the countryside, because that's where God rests in some ways, and working class and farm culture must be preserved for a complex array of reasons. Your point about how much has changed is really interesting. Um, I think that much has changed, um, and in fact, he provides a way of understanding that. So in his book, Marxism and Literature, he talks about that we must move away from what are called base superstructure models. That cultural form has its own autonomy. That um, traditional Marxist analysis says that um, changing anything requires a change in the base which is only the economy, it's paid masculine labor. Now that's interesting in that he comes from a mining family and it was paid masculinized labor. And his point is we must move away from that because culture has its own modes of production. And those in fact can have specific gendered forms and those are radically being transformed as we, as, as we situate, as we do cultural work. So he provides the door, actually, to think he doesn't go through his stuff. Though he does in his book, Television, when he talks about how television as a cultural form is transforming our emotional identities. So he again provides multiple doors of doing that. An example, I'm going on too long, but let me just say one thing about television. He says, think about commercials. So all of us know in our bodies when a commercial comes on. The music goes up, we're at a point, a key point in a soap opera. And thank God the commercial comes on because we have to go to the toilet. Right? We'll get a cup of coffee. But we already know before the music starts, with that crescendo, that the commercial is about to come. And he says, this is planned flow. So, so even the news, where you're talking about the bombings of Yemen or Brexit, right? or the current politics here. But now a word from McDonald's. So the cultural assemblage is working on our identities in ways that were not the same as growing up in a mining community where he bases his class camps. So again, he does provide the doors to say, what is it about the media that connects us, that makes our emotional content more similar than it would have been before, but he doesn't talk about internationalism or the fact that I'm in contact with people in Chiapas about organizing principles. Okay? It's a very, very fine question about how can we internationalize these issues of country and power. Is that enough? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I'm sorry we're not so long, but these things make me think powerfully about this stuff. On behalf of our team, go on, New York, I would like to thank you. Michael, for being here today and for a very, very thought-provoking talk. Um, you offered us a general view that we can all relate to and that I'm sure resonates in all of us, despite of our cultural or geographical context. However, the cases that you offered from US the examples are quite shocking. Um, Finland is considered egalitarian. The school system is considered democratic. Uh, our socioeconomic differences are relatively small but growing, and school choice, regional differences, and all that is growing. So it is indeed important for us to continue um, our struggles and redefinitions of democracy and social justice. So thank you for reminding us. Thanks. And. Uh, I would like to, or we would like to welcome you to um, to the, the cafeteria on the right side. Uh, we have a group release event happening there right now, and after that, a short meet and people event where we can continue discussion.